Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to an evening of stand-up comedy here at the Grand Theatre Leeds. Would you now please kindly put your hands together for me, Ben Elton. Thank you. very kind to respond uh, with such warmth to that astonishingly self-indulgent request, request for uh, applause before I've done anything at all. I always think it's the strangest business to be in a job where you can do that, you get the applause before anything, so I'm going to do my best to justify it as the evening progresses. Let's start with establishing the parameters for the evening. I must do this because there's been some misunderstandings and I hate to think of an audience going away feeling shortchanged, disappointed in any way. Because this tour's been going on four months and here we are in election year. Oh yes! <laughs> And a lot of people asking the same question. Are you going to do all the politics, Ben? Are you going to stick all that principle, all those uh, concerns? Are you going to shove all that into the act? Well, I'm not going to bother. The politicians don't anymore. Why should I? <laughs> it's all style and no content these days, isn't it? What a shame. Sound bite culture we've arrived at. We've got new labour. What is it? I've been in a party 20 years, I haven't got the faintest idea. <laughs> I watched Mr Blair at last summer's conference season, he tried to make it clear. He said, New Labour is about New Britain. It's about a better Britain. It's about a brighter Britain. It's about a more britain he sort of Britain. Yeah, but what is it? <laughs> Tony, they could get Danny Baker to do the party political <laughs> He needs a job, he could revive his dad's style, couldn't he? <laughs> Are you telling me, Danny, I can have a better and a brighter Britain and at no extra cost? <laughs> I think I'm going to have a little bit of that myself, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go easy on myself, yeah? So I'm going to be a bit less controversial. I'm going to be less irritating. I'm going to wind up a few less people. This is going to be New Ben! Yeah. <laughs> there will be no knob gags under New Ben! No, 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 because the British knob is the best in the world. <laughs> and it's had the piss taken out of it for too long. <laughs> I pledge to you all, here tonight, that I shall put the great back into great, big throbbing, blue vein stonker. <laughs> You see, ladies and gentlemen, it's all style, no content. This is shaping up to be the most boring, uninspiring election in history. There's no issues. They're all chasing the centre ground. Law and order. Patriotism. Everyone's cloaking themselves in the flag. Labour have got more Union Jacks up than the Tories. They all said the same thing. They're going to put the great back into Britain. They've all said it. Why can't we be proud of what we are, eh? Why can't we accept what we are today, be proud and happy with that, play to our strengths and not get involved in stuff we just can't do? We never should have gone to the Olympics. <laughs> we just shouldn't have gone. It was asking for it, wasn't it? Our poor old team. We put them through it and they got off the plane. Well, you're going to take the piss out of us now or wait five seconds, eh? <laughs> It was outrageous. Nobody wanted us there. All the other, other teams were complaining to the International Committee. You haven't invited the British, have you? They're shit! <laughs> we don't want to play them. Us turning up at the Olympics it was like a man with no knob turning up at an orgy. <laughs> we're supposed to be ashamed, ladies and gentlemen. We're supposed to be ashamed. We only got one gold medal. Shamed in front of the world. We got one gold medal. We're a nation of 60 million people. We're one of the G7 economic superpowers. We got one gold. And that was in rowing. <laughs> As if anyone gives a flying fuck in a high wind. I mean, it's a little bit tough to have a street party on the strength of that one. You know what I'm saying? I'm not ashamed at all. I don't care. I feel sorry for the individual sportsmen and women involved, of course, but beyond that, I don't give a toss, because as far as I'm concerned, the Olympics, as with all international and national sporting events, has been perverted. The sporting ideal is no more about community and playing together and everyone. Now, it's all money. It's all sponsorship. So nobody cares about anything but winners, career earnings, sponsorship deals. Never mind about losers. There's no money in losers. That's not what sport's about. Sport's not about some kind of physical elitism. It's about everyone getting involved. I mean, if you were having a game of cricket in a park, and there was someone in the bat who was a bit crap, you'd give them a go, wouldn't you? Give them an easy one, bowl underarm, wouldn't you? Give them a go. <laughs> well, I reckon that's what the Australians and the West Indians ought to do for us next time. <laughs> of course they should. That 
would be sporty. They come over here, they say, all right, look, come on, lads, give him a chance. He's only British. All right, mate, now look, have a, have a go with that then. Oh, dear. Look, I'll tell you what we'll do. We won't count that. You're still in. All right, here we go. I'll tell you what I'll do, mate. Look, I'll, I'll put my jumper halfway. You've only got to run as far as that. The other night somebody shouted out, yeah, what about New Zealand? What about the Kiwis? Yeah, of course, we won, didn't we? We won a game in New Zealand, yes, yeah, sporting renaissance. <laughs> I think we should remind ourselves before we hang out too much bunting that there are more people in Birmingham than there are in New Zealand. <laughs> you know, the dice are slightly loaded in our favour in this case. But the point is, if we are going to get involved in these international sporting events, we've got to use our head. You see, we're obviously crap at all the games. What we've got to do is invent some new ones. Traditionally, we always invent the games, and then while well, a year or two it takes everyone else to learn the rules, we can win a few seasons, you see. <laughs> we've got to invent some new games. The, the Americans, they're always shoving in a new sport all the time, aren't they? In the Olympics last time, what was it? Beach volleyball. That's what the Americans had. Beach volleyball. Olympic beach volleyball. What's coming next, eh? Sand castle building. <laughs> Bury dad without waking him up. It's a good one. Try and get your trunks on without anyone seeing your knob. <laughs> that would be a good spectator sport, wouldn't it? All the big Russians, Bell End show. It's under the of his towel there. That'll cost him points. They never should have used such a well-hung athlete. That was a mistake. Bit of arsehole cleavage from the Germans. That'll cost them points. We'd win that, wouldn't we, eh? The British. No one sees our bits on the beach. <laughs> Let's get involved in some sports we can do. Something we train for. Drinking games. That's what we do. That's what we're selling. We should have gone to Atlanta. We should have said, all right, they're all running the 100 metres sprint. Who cares? We should have said, calm down. I'm not impressed. So you can run fast. So what? There's no bus. What's the point? <laughs> right, you stood still. Good. Relaxed. Here we go, then. Let's see you light one of your farts. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You can borrow my lighter. See if you can send a sheet of blue flame across a crowded snug. Go on, have a go. <laughs> See if you can catch one in a jar, keep it half an hour, then surprise your girlfriend with it. <laughs> it's not easy. It takes as much physical dexterity and skill as, as running fast or jumping high. I mean, why is it that certain physical attributes are deemed laudable and others aren't? Why is it that you can jump high? That means great, wonderful, much to be applauded. But if you can burp a Kylie Minogue medley, it's just rude. <laughs> I know, which I consider more entertaining, frankly. <laughs> I mean, come on, the high jump. Does any, I mean, what, has anyone thought about these sports in the 2,000 years since the Greeks invented them? I mean, what, high jump, so what? Marvellous athlete, jumps in the air, tremendous. Trains every day, since the age of five, goes into a field every day and jumps in the air. Marvellous, jumps and he's down again and then a few minutes rest and another jump. Marvellous, well done that man. Who cares, the world's moved on, we've got lifts, we've got ladders. <laughs> I want to say to the silly bugger, get on a chair, mate. Make it easy. You can do it, beast. Who decides these things? What's good? What's bad? What's groovy? What's uncool? I mean, it is strange how sports have actually got fashion attached to them. You know, some sports are fashionable and some aren't. I mean, like football has become so fashionable, hasn't it? Everybody, all the stars trying to hang out with footballers. It gives them that kind of blokey credibility. You know what I mean? It's all that football thing. You know, it's like, uh, I'm not saying that football hasn't always been popular. Of course it's been popular. It's the most popular game of all. But let's not mistake popularity with fashionableness. I mean, you know, Noel Edmonds knows a story or two about that. <laughs> the truth is that out of the blue, out of the blue, football's become groovy. You've got all your comics and all your alternatives and all your musicians falling over each other had to go on about how much they like their football because it implies a kind of instant ironic wit an instant blokiness he's the way he likes his football know what I'm saying he's the way you know, even the girls the girls like football yeah we're the Spice Girls yeah we like our football everybody likes their football what's this about I mean football's always been around don't get me wrong I'm not knocking it it's great I mean actually football serves an extremely important socio-anthropological function football was invented because blokes have got nothing to say to their mates. <laughs> Without football, nothing. 
football was invented to fill in the gaps between pints. But suddenly, <laughs> out of blue, it's become groovy and fashionable. You can instantly sound kind of witty if you mention it. How does that happen? Why is it that one physical recreation is, is, is farty and nerdy and turdy and gets worth, and another is good old blokey bloke bloke? What is that about? Why is it that the lad who uh, wraps a blanket round his neck, who you know, calls him, pretends it's a cloak, calls himself Gandalf, War Wizard of the Troll Hobbits <laughs> and plays Dungeons and Dragons of a weekend. How come he's a total farty, turdy, nerdy Gitsworth? And the bloke next door, who spends 40 quid on a nylon shirt with the name of a Korean typewriter firm on the front, <laughs> is a bloody good blokey bloke. He's all right, he likes his football. What is that about? It's about style, ladies and gentlemen. It's about fashion. Fashion sounds a bit like fascism, and I think they're similar because we are intimidated. We are dictated to. We are the victims of style. We live and are drowning under a tidal wave of style bullshit. You don't buy newspapers anymore. You buy style papers. They've got a couple of pages of news at the front. The rest of it's style and media and people and buzz and vibe. You, you, you get your Sunday papers. There's that many style sections. You can't lift the bastard up in the news agent. <laughs> you buy your Sunday shakes. You've got to wade through your culture section, your vibe, your buzz, your people, your style, your gig, your groove, your wank, your pretentious bollocks. <laughs> We're all reading the pretentious bollocks section at a Sunday shake to find out how uncool we are this week. <laughs> well, I say thus far and no further. I'm standing up and being counted uncool and proud of it. Because there's nothing wrong with being uncool. It's the people trying to be cool who cause all the trouble. People carry knives, they're trying to look cool. People bully people, they're trying to look cool. Uncool people never hurt anyone. All they do is stand around staring at trains. <laughs> So let's start celebrating uncool. This starts tonight. This tour is a celebration. I'm doing this gig tonight for the people who wear the anoraks. Yes, I am. They wear them because it's cold outside and it rains. That's why they wear them, not to piss off the editor of Loaded magazine. No. I'm here for the people who wear the shell suits. Yes, I am. They wear them because they're cheap and you can put the whole family in them. Everyone in the same design. It looks a load of shit, but you can find each other in Toys R Us on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Style has become synonymous with aggression. That's what I find so disheartening. We're living in an age where if you want to look cool, you've got to sneer. You can't afford to be an enthusiast. You're an enthusiast, you're wanker. You know? Everything is about sneering. Style, you know, I want a wanker. Loaded magazine, bunch of arse, wanker of the week. Girly show, girly show. Oh dear. <laughs> this is style, you know, nice tits and everyone's a wanker. This is new feminism, blimey. I'm amazed Mrs. Pankhurst never worked it out 90 years ago. She could have stood outside Buckingham Palace with her tits out going, what a lot of wankers, eh? Wank <laughs> Dear, oh dear. I mean, I can remember the time when you wanted to be stylish. You loved people, you know. It was the 60s. Every, you were a wanker. I love you, man. That's great. You know, I love you. It's like, but now you want to be stylish, you've got to sneer. You've got to be aggressive. The SAS. Out of the blue, the SAS had become a fashion icon. Never could have predicted it, but five years ago it all started. A publishing revolution. The SAS have become a publisher's dream. There's been like 30 books. They've all been top 10. They've saved some of the small publishers. I mean, it's the only thing the SAS have actually saved in quite a long time. <laughs> Incredible load of books. They've sold loads. But what are you actually saying about yourself when you're reading these books, you know? Sat on a bus reading Bravo to Zero or The One That Got Away. You might as well have, yes, I am a bit sad, written on your forehead. <laughs> Divides the audience a little. There's always a fair number of lads going steady on, been fucking hell. <laughs> you know, respect, Ben, you know, I respect, you know, for the best. The elite, you know, like Bravo 2 1 Commander Power, yeah, the elite, yeah. You know, the best, respect, you know. Because, you know, Bravo 2 0, it's not, it's not wank, no, no, it's a proper history book, yeah, it's history, yeah. It's history, that is, yeah, for the best. Best? Best of what? Self-publicity, yes, granted, but I thought the whole point was they were supposed to remain discreet. <laughs> it's not very difficult for a foreign power to come across them when they're signing books at Waterstones. 
best, best of what? The entire Bravo 20 cult is based on a fiasco, a completely failed mission in the Gulf War. The SAS in a desert in Iraq looking for the Iraqis couldn't find them. This is Britain's best, I remind you. They couldn't find an Iraqi in Iraq. <laughs> With that, couldn't we? Even we? We've not been trained, but we've got to work it out. No, wrong place. Go to Baghdad, where they live. <laughs> not in desert, no water. Iraqi, not stupid. <laughs> They're all wandering around the desert going, anyone seen them? No, I've not seen them. <laughs> you seen them, Sarge? No, not me either. And we're the best. Imagine if they'd sent the crap. <laughs> <laughs> What's the sign of orders? Uh, Iraqis, towel on the head, a little bit excitable. Anyone seen them? No. <laughs> They're always getting lost. Yes, they, yes, they got lost in Iraq, they got lost in Borneo, Horn of Africa. They're always getting lost. Never know where they're going. What's that about? They've been trained. What's the problem? I'll tell you what it is. Why they can't find out where they're going? They've all got those black bars in front of their eyes, haven't they? <laughs> no wonder they can't see where they're going. <laughs> Silly buggers. Lift the bar. Oh, look at that. I was in a shop. In Smith the other day, having a look, you know, at the SAS books, you know, just getting material, and also because it's pretty exciting stuff, actually. And, <laughs> and I just had to laugh. You know, you don't often laugh out loud in public. You know, if you see something funny, you go, hmm, yes, that's quite amusing, yes. <laughs> I'll tell someone about that in a pub later, you know, but just occasionally, you actually do laugh. And I was, I couldn't believe it, because the big one they were flogging in, in Smith, right, this was actually just before Christmas, was the SAS Survival Guide. This was the big book. They had dumpings, loads of them. And it it wasn't even like a book. What it was was it was a folder, a ring pull clip folder. And what you did was you opened it up and you opened the clips and you took out the page that was relevant to your survival situation and then you survived it and then you put it back in and clipped it back in and closed it. It's probably exactly like it isn't a real SAS, isn't it? Yeah. And I was having a look at this. And the poster, right, big bloke with a machine gun and a bar across his eyes. And he says, uh, it says essential survival information from Britain's best essential survival tactics for the elite of the elite. Essential. I thought, well, I better have a look. Blimey. Can't think how I got through life so far. I better have a, better have a quick flick in case I get garroted on the way past Boots, you know. <laughs> so I opened it right. First page I saw, no word of a lie. Edible grasses, lichens and mosses of the British Isles. <laughs> now, how pissed would you have to be... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, we've all rolled out the boozer in our time and eaten some shite, haven't we? <laughs> but you've never actually gone as far as, come on, lads, let's go and scrape a bit of lichen off a rock. <laughs> bit of chilli sauce, pit of bread, lovely. <laughs> if they wanted to give us some essential survival information, they could tell us where we can find an edible Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> I don't know what it's about, this aggression, and particularly for blokes, this kind of chippy blokiness that's going on. You know, this aggressive thing. I think the reason is that men are really going through an identity crisis. This has been well documented by psychologists. Men are feeling beleaguered and, and on the back foot. They don't know who they are anymore. Well, let's face it, the jobs whereby a, a man defined his, 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 his worth to himself and his family and his community, those heavy industrial jobs, they've gone. Uh, the girls are ahead at school. You know, the future is increasingly more cerebral, and the girls seem to be better at it. They're ahead at school and university. The future's looking female. Blokes are feeling beleaguered and there's a physical problem too besetting us to go with all that. It's down there in the gonads. It's sperm. You know this, I'm sure. Sperm counts are down. I'm sure you've been reading about it. But not just a little down. We're talking catastrophically down, like 25% drop since before the war. Now, now that, that's big. They don't know whether it's to do with the additives in the food or pollution. But for whatever reason, every man in this room is packing a considerably runnier mix downstairs <laughs> than Grandad did. Now, you all thought Grandad was a bit of a silly old fucker, didn't you? Stupid git sat in the corner of the room dribbling and always wanting to watch a different channel than the rest of the family. Him and his mates in a photo album. What a lot of wankers before the war. Flat caps. An interesting game of football they used to play. But let me tell you now, they had flipping big bollocks. That's why they used to wear those big shorts, you see. Fit their bollocks in. That's what that was about. That's why the game was so slow. It was as much as they could do to drag their bollocks down the pitch. Oh, Dixie Dean's making a tremendous brave dash down the court line, dragging his colossal scrotum along the middle of the 
Suddenly, you know, if you go to a if you go to a museum, everyone always has the same kind of reaction when they go to a museum. They, they, if they see a suit of armour, they say, "Oh, isn't he short? Wasn't medieval man short? Look at that, four foot eleven, five foot. Wasn't medieval man short?" He wasn't short. He was bow-legged. <laughs> and the problem is, of course, no, you've got to be, uh, be aware that the NHS is actually under a great deal of pressure because of this sperm crisis. Because, uh, hard-pressed as it is, there's even more people going to the fertility clinics wanting to check out the mix, make sure things aren't too soupy in the wife fronts. And a lot more men would be applying for sperm tests if they had the guts. Because a recent article said that GPs are saying a lot of men are nervous about this, wondering about their fertility, etc. They're embarrassed. They don't want to have the sperm test. So here I am to perform a social service because, don't be nervous, it is an easy thing. You know, I can help. I mean, I, was, I don't mean I, I don't mean I can help directly. What I'm saying is that it's an easy, it's no problem. I have had a sperm test and it is a symbol, you just go and do it. But a lot of blokes think it's like that, the way it used to be, very sleazy, you know, because in the old days you have to produce the sample at the clinic, so there'd like be a group of guys waiting and one by one you go in a room and they give you a little dirty mag. It's a horrible type of do. But these days, they let you produce your sample at home, which is of course much, you know, much more relaxing. They'll lend you the mag, lads, don't worry about that. <laughs> oh yeah, you can take the dirty mag. You won't be able to get it open, but you can have it. <laughs> But they let you produce your sample at home because sperm apparently survives an hour once outside the body. So as long as you can get back to the clinic with the sample within an hour, they let you produce it at home, which is nice. You know, it's more relaxing, it's more civilised. And there's an upside, gentlemen. Well, the first time in your entire life, you get to have a legitimate wank. <laughs> oh, yes, no sneaking off to the toilet for you that morning in the sitting room. On the sofa in front of the fire. Loud and proud! <laughs> right, love, I'm gonna have a wank! I don't care if your mother is coming round! <laughs> this is a medical necessity! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so you obviously have to go to the clinic to get the, the receptacle, a little sterilised plastic pot, you know, they've got to give you that. You can't, you can't just take it along in a teacup, you know. It's like, you can't just take your sheets along. <laughs> Please, Ben, you're 37, get away. Anyway, so you go to the doctor, and it's funny, he seemed quite embarrassed. I don't know why, he was saying, you understand, Mr. Elton, the process, you know, what is required, where, whereby you produce your sample, you understand what is necessary. I suggest, doctor, I think I can just about recall, you know. I may be a little rusty, it could be as much as three or even four hours since I visited Mrs. Hand and her five lovely daughters, but nonetheless... And it'll come flooding back. So, so he gives you the pot, right? Here you go. Um, this is all true. Um, this is the help. This is a social service I'm performing now. Because it'd be lads singing, all right, yeah, take this down, I'll take this down. So anyway, you, you take the pot home, and in your own time, you know, in your own space, one off the wrist, as one does, you know, into the pot. Which, which incidentally, is not bleeding easy. It's a tiny little pot. They give you no funnel, nothing like that. No. I mean, ejaculation is not an exact science in my experience. <laughs> it's outrageous. It's a tiny little pot they give you. It's outrageous. Anyway, finally, you know, you get it, you know, you, as you can, best you can, into the pot. You know, put the top on the pot. If you can fit a fucking top on the pot. <laughs> Bloody hell, I need more capacity than that. Here, I'll take your dustbin. Here we go. <laughs> Two minutes later, I was back. There you go, know, Dr. Testos. You'll have to wrestle the bastards first. <laughs> Dolphins coming out of that bit. <laughs> Where I come from, a pot is adequate. So anyway, you put, <laughs> you put your top on the pot to cour it down and then you've got to get back to the clinic within an hour right and uh, that means that you obviously got to rush but you've got to keep it warm because the sperm will die if not kept at bodily temperature so what you do doctor says absolutely true get the pot stick it down your pants that's what he says get that stick it down your pants work it if possible into a warm and sweaty crevice <laughs> if you can shove it up your ass <laughs> It's true, that's exactly what they say. You get it? Uh, not all the way up, obviously. Just, you know, clamp it gently and get back, to the, get back to the clinic within an hour. So, I'm off out into the streets, as you will. 
This is true, I'm saying. I'm walking along thinking, I hope I don't get knocked down now. You just feel exposed, you know? I mean, it's nothing, it's funny, because there's nothing illegal or anything about being found with a pot of spunk in your pants. It's, it just doesn't look good, does it? You don't want to have the conversation, you know what I'm saying? But the problem is you've got to rush, you've got to be careful, but you've got to rush. Oh no, I've only got an hour, 48 minutes, 47 minutes, taxi, taxi. Excuse me, mate, can I take this one? I've got some spunk up my arse and it's dying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, you get to the clinic, you hand it in, and this is where the trouble starts, gentlemen. This is why I'm doing this, Ruth, it's a social service, because you will feel beleaguered and exposed and emasculated. Because they don't go up past you instantly. They don't go, oh yes, that looks absolutely marvellous. We'll take you all done. No, no. They say, thanks a lot, we'll be in touch. And then you've got to wait. Then you've got to wait, right, Well, some stranger is testing your sperm. And suddenly you who thought you were a relatively relaxed, fairly to get a sort of individual, are desperately, oh my God, am I a man? Have I, oh, I'm being tested, my manhood, what if I fail? I, I wish I cheated. Use someone else's dick, you know. A, <laughs> genuinely, you feel exposed and, and, and then the letter comes. Now I'm telling you, gentlemen, this is going to happen to you, so take it easy, be ready, because like it's unpleasant. Now, it's very impersonal, it's a printed form. So many people have sperm tests, they don't send you a nice letter. Now it's a printed form, dot, 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 they fill in your figures. That's all. Top of the letter, it says, results, Mr. Elton, spunk test. <laughs> now listen, it's not going to be any nicer for you. You be sitting down, have a cup of tea ready, because there's no counselling, there's no preamble. They're straight in, in with a solar plexus. First line, 33%! Sluggish. <laughs> Sluggish. What a word to use about a man's gullop. I mean, couldn't they have been kind? No, couldn't they have said relaxed or something like that? <laughs> Sluggish. Not giving it a sufficient wriggle. No, not in good. Next line, no better. Worse. I'm on the floor now. I've fainted. They're fanning me to get me round. 41% swimming in the wrong direction. <laughs> Stupid spunk! <laughs> the stuff is backing away at me, thinking fear! <laughs> then I think, hang on a minute, this isn't fair, this test is rigged! <laughs> How are they supposed to know what's the right direction, poor little bastards? They're in a plastic pot! <laughs> They're all wriggling around, I don't know, anyone seen an egg? I, I don't know where. <laughs> supposed to go. They're wriggling hither and thither. They're like the SAS in Iran. <laughs> Mind you, <laughs> I suspect there's quite a few women in the audience thinking they don't need the services of the National Health Service to point out that spunk sometimes swims in the wrong direction. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Any woman who's ever been foolish enough to have that quick last minute shag prior to going out to a post dinner party. <laughs> Got himself all ready, new frock and all that, and suddenly he's desperate. Oh, come on, darling, come on. I'll be too pissed when we get home. Come on, come on. <laughs> She's, oh, go on then, quick, but don't mess up my hair. Go on, here we are. <laughs> Which is all very well, except till you get to the dinner party. Everything's going nicely. You sat down, having the hors d'oeuvres, and you cough. <laughs> Suddenly, out of the blue, your knickers are full of it. Very nice. You've got to sit in a spunk swamp all evening. Pleasant. You don't want to move in case your fanny farts. It's not good. You've been nibbling on a bit of toast and pate. Two crumbs at the back of your neck. Bang! Three and a half million sperms, Ed, but you gusset. You look down, you're sitting on an embroidered chair. You think, if this soaks through, I'm going to have to kill myself. You actually got to sit there all night till it dries three in the morning, everyone's gone. You're going, I'd like another cup of coffee if I could. I'll tell you what, I've never heard a better argument for safe sex. You know, all the posters the government have for, say, trying to get people to use condoms. That's what they should say. Girls, if you don't want it all back in your knickers half an hour later, <laughs> tell the bastard to bag it up and take it away with him. <laughs> I must say, it's ruder than I thought. <laughs> I only came along because I quite like Constable Goody in the thin blue line. <laughs> anyway, where was I? I'm reading this letter, right? And, and it's like, already I'm devastated, but it gets worse. By the last line, it's saying 80% overall inadequate. 80% no use. 
I'm devastated. I mean, how would you feel? It's like a sudden blow. I'm not a man. I, I failed my, my sperm test. Can, can I take it again? Is, <laughs> is it like your driving test, you know? <laughs> have as many goes as you like. Yeah, I failed four times, but actually my doctors were real bastards because I had great sperm from the start. I really did. <laughs> no, I failed. Except I haven't failed because at the bottom of the letter it says passed. Fine. Not bad, not good, bog standard, dollop of spunk, fair enough, you've passed. <laughs> and I learnt that day something that all men, I think, should take on board, and that is that most spunk is no good. Honestly, there's very little of any use in every drop. There's only a couple of decent wrigglers in an entire wristful. <laughs> it's true. But, uh, this is true. The rest of them, they're all rubbish. They're sluggish, they're stupid, they're in the wrong direction, they don't know where they're going, they've got no idea what's going on. They're like a pub full of blokes, really. <laughs> but what... <laughs> What really kind of, I suppose, in a way, brought, really made me think about the whole experience, because it's a true story, was how exposed I felt about the possibility that I might not live up to some spurious norm of what is required for sexuality. You know, we're all so vulnerable. Naturally, we've always, as a, as a we laugh at sex. It's funny, it's fun, but it's funny. No one's that good, for God's sake. I saw this wonderful documentary was really kind of, you know, life enhancing. It was these, these women, they were having an Ann Summers sort of party. You know Ann Summers, the sex shops? They, you don't have to go to the shop sometimes. They have kind of girls' parties at home, like a Tupperware party, except it's like a gussetware party, you know. <laughs> and all the girls sat around having a cup of tea, laughing at the dildos. And it was funny, because that's all they were doing. They were pissing themselves. Oh, look at that! There's a whopper! I've never seen one like that. Blimey! Oh, look at that cock ring! That'd rattle around on my old man! Ha! <laughs> well, I'm not saying they're standing the comedy was high, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying they were having a laugh and that was marvellous. It wasn't serious, it was a joke. Oh, I'll buy that for Cindy for her 21st, she can unwrap that in the curry house, ha ha ha, you know. Because nobody uses those sex aids, they're just a joke, people buy them for presents. No one actually uses the things. <laughs> oh dear. Again, I fear I've failed to leap the cultural divide here. Long, cold nights up in Leeds, clearly. <laughs> yes, I can see a few very doubtful women down there sat there thinking, well, I must say, he's got that wrong, hasn't he? <laughs> Speak for yourself, Mr. Elton. I've got my oriental love balls up me twat as you but you have, I wouldn't be surprised, girls. You probably thought, well, he might be a bit boring. He's been off the telly for a few years. I'll shove the love balls up. <laughs> if he gets done, I'll give him a clank, have an all. <laughs> Blokes out next to you, I wonder what that clanking. What have you? <laughs> have you got the love balls up? Yes, I've got them up. Lovely. I'd love a go at them love balls. I would love a go. I'm fascinated. I'll tell you what, if I had a fanny, that would be the first thing I'd do. <laughs> first thing, double portion, straight up. Well, life would be beautiful. Nothing and matter. Every little stroll would be a dream. Every shudder of the underground train and rattle up and down on the buses. Marvellous. You, any little drop, who cares? I'll take the rubbish out, darling. I like a stroll. Whoa. <laughs> Waiting for a bus? Who cares? Everyone else, the fucking bus is late. You'll be going, yes! <laughs> the bus is late! <laughs> hey! <laughs> Turn it to total strangers. How was the bus being late for you then, darling? <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you haven't got them up, girls, what about running for a bus? You'd never make it, would you? Oh, bloody Jesus! You'd be over prostrate. Everyone else would be on the bus going to work. You'd be lying there in the gutter having a fag. <laughs> Now, there might be one or two of you thinking, hang on, this is a bit off the point. I thought we were talking about style over content and all that, but actually it's not off the point. It's a classic example. Because, you see, uh, Anne Summers, they don't call their sex aids sex aids. They, like all reputable sex shops, call them marital aids. Again, you see, we cover up what we know because we have a conspiracy in this country to accept that sex only happens within the family, heterosexual marriages. You know, the government has even, even legislated on this issue. They've said we can have sex education in schools, but it must be taught within the context of a family married environment. Now, this is outrageous. This is disgusting. We're inheriting this American habit of scoring cheap political capital out of people's lifestyle circumstances. You see slimy bastard politicians at conference using single mothers or, or homosexuals as scapegoats for the ills of society. It's disgusting. And here, when I got married, I was, I was told I'd made a political act. 
Journos were saying, oh, getting married, Ben. Very conservative thing to do. Not all you expect from Bullshit Ben at all. Have you mellowed, Ben? Have you mellowed? Very conservative. Getting married. Getting married. Very conservative. I thought, well, yeah, I suppose they're right, really, when you think about it. Because, like, you know, I'm married now. All I've got to do is get myself a secretary and start fucking her on the side, <laughs> and I'll be eligible to join the cabinet, won't I? <laughs> But marriage has become a political football, it has, you know, it's an American thing, but we've got it now. People are talking about marriage as if it's something politicians have got a duty to protect or uphold or whatever. All the polis are doing it, you know, and they're worried because not enough people are getting married, you know. I, the reason people are getting married is it's such a hassle, you know. And let me tell you, if you want to know exactly what it feels like to get married, there's a very easy way to recreate the whole feeling. What you do, you want to feel like preparing for a wedding, exactly how it feels, every morning for two months, Go to your bank, open all the windows, and shovel money out of the windows. <laughs> That's exactly how it feels to prepare for a wedding, because no one has any concept of how much a wedding is going to cost until they get involved. It doesn't matter whether your budget is large or small, whatever it is, you will exceed it tenfold. <laughs> Marriages cost more than you think. Flowers, for instance. Now, everyone knows flowers are expensive. Always have that experience once every year, Valentine's Day, 15 fucking quid, bollocks, I'll send you a card. <laughs> but when you get married, you've got to have flowers, and you've no idea what flowers you've got to get. For one thing, uh, marriage flowers aren't called flowers, no. They're called blooms. <laughs> and blooms are exactly the same as flowers, except they cost ten times as much. <laughs> you know, you go to the florist, you go to the bloomist. She says, oh, hello, my lovers, you lovely couple, you beautiful, my darlings. What's your bloom budget? What were you hoping to spend on blooms? So you tell her. She laughs! She says, oh, I thought you were in love, dear, oh dear, you're not taking it seriously. You've no concept! For the flowers, you've got to buy them. I mean, you know you've got to stump up for a bridal arch and a posy for the cute little bridesmaid who'll throw up on it halfway through the ceremony. But no, there's flowers you never dreamt existed. Centerpieces. She says, the blue mist, she says, what are you having on the tables, my darlings? What will you have on your tables? I said, well, booze. <laughs> Food, you know, towards the end of the evening, possibly a few heads in puddles of vomit, you know. <laughs> no, you've got to have centerpieces, floral. Pieces, 70 quid ago, you could re the bathroom. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, a bunch of old grannies walk off with them under their arm. <laughs> I want to say, come back with my life, you old cow. <laughs> You're not even from my side of the family. <laughs> Put it down. Yeah, like, they should look fucking beautiful. Any idea what they cost? <laughs> Stop sniffing them. You're wearing them out. All right. <laughs> We need to change the traditions. They're not relevant to the modern situation. For instance, the bridal night, still treated with so much significance. Now, there was a time, of course, when a bridal night was the most significant moment of a young couple's life. My God, they never had a hand on each other till that very moment. They couldn't wait. They're rushing the service. Yes, I do, for fuck's sake, get on! <laughs> we said all this in the rehearsal yesterday. Do we really need to go through it again? <laughs> Off to, the, off to the reception. No, all right, one course, no pudding, no coffee, no speeches. Come on, darling, we're off. <laughs> you know, these days, a couple get married. They, they've been living together for five years. They probably stopped shagging two years ago. <laughs> they only got married because it was that old breakup and they thought they'd give it a go, you know. <laughs> And of course it's their party. They're not going to bugger off at 10.30 in a shower of confetti. They're going to have a night of it. But the problem is, another tradition says no one's allowed to leave till the bride's gone. So it's not five in the morning, you know. The, the grannies are beginning to die around, around the edge of the room. There's pacemakers giving out, you know. They're thinking about keeping a vigor on for a couple of funerals the next day. Finally, they get back to the... Bridal suite, you know, the bride and groom, they book the bridal suite, the local hotel, you know it's a bridal suite because there's a doily on the toilet roll, you know, that's, <laughs> that's how you know. They get back, they're pissed as assholes. they can't, they're staggering, they can't find the light switch, they're in the dark, <laughs> tripping over the toilet, looking for the bed, they can't, she drops the bombshell, out of the blue, she says it, come on then, you've got to shag me. <laughs> says what <laughs> she says it's our bridal night you gotta do it i mean we'll be special you gotta shake me he says no way <laughs> i have had 23 points 
disappear. She says you've got to do it separate. It will I'll be shamed. My friends will know if we don't consume me. If we do con consume me. If, if you don't shut me. Look, I can't. He just says you've got to do it. It's, I can't. He says, look, you don't have to do anything fancy. Just stick it in for a minute. That's all. So we can say we did. He says stick what? You don't love me, I knew you didn't love me. I mean, he's desperate, he's searching the hotel room, trying to find a pencil and a bit of sellotape to lash together a rudimentary splint, you know. He's, he's wondering whether there's a page dealing with this in his SAS survivor's guide. <laughs> She's not giving up, you've got to do it, I can't, it's my bread all night. You've got to do it. She, he says, she says, come on, I'll entice you. <laughs> He's darling, you got him, so he's going to have a go. This sidle's over, start snogging, you know, hoping something will get going. He's having a cup, so I love you, darling. Yeah, I knew you loved me, darling. You know, slowly but surely, a little bit of romance begins to happen. He's, he's thinking, I might get away with it. There's a touch of firmness here. I think I might get away with it. Then, oh no, disaster. One of them burps with a bit of sick in it. <laughs> Go in the bathroom and eat some toothpaste. <laughs> Come back here and shag me. <laughs> Five hours later, he wakes up. Floor of the toilet. Tube of Colgate in his arm. 